going to record in the cloud. Good morning, everyone. For those of you who are brave enough, you know, and, you know, to uh, engage in this morning's exciting Gateway GIS virtual speaker series, we have with us a very special guest, Mr. Luke Mc, is it Gartland? McGartland, yeah. Hey, I'm going to let him take over and get started. Uh, with his presentation, and I'm sure he'll tell you more about himself. And if not, I'm quite sure you all can feel free to, you know, to engage by inquiring, you know, of him, uh, whatever, you know, questions you have, okay? So I'm sharing the screen now. Uh, Luke, I'm pulling up the screen. It seems like, which one should I pull up? Should I pull up? Oh, no, I'll, I'll pull, I'll, I'll share. Okay. So You got it? Yeah. All right, can you see my screen? Uh, can everybody see his screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm admitting cool. some people. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Okay. And is the link is the link accessible in the chat for people after after they join in, or does the chat only the chat history only show up after they? Luke, I'll uh, make sure that we join. put a Luke. Okay. I'll make sure we put a link to the post in our posts for this. Uh, uh, for Perfect. this class that we use. Okay. Okay. Good. Perfect. Yeah, because I'm I'm the MIDI student, so you all go ahead and get started. I'm gonna mute myself. Okay. All right. Thanks, Roz. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you everybody for giving me the opportunity to speak to y'all. Um, uh, a buddy of mine, uh, John Miller, I think, spoke to maybe some of, some of you last year, and he introduced me and Roz, and I just thought that um, what you guys are doing with uh, thinking about art and technology and adding in the kind of geospatial themes um, and looking at the intersection of all of these things it is just a it's an incredible program and it's definitely the type of skill set that um, the future needs and it's something that's very near and dear to me this intersection of art and technology and it's something that's really defined a lot of my life so I again I'm thrilled to be able to, to speak to you guys and just share a little bit about myself, um, what I do, um, where I've been, some of the things where I'm going, and also just uh, make myself available to, to everybody that gets a chance to see this presentation for any kind of further questions or follow-ups on, on any of the things that I discussed. Because again, the intersection of art and technology, there's a, there's a lot of things going on there uh, in the design world, the tech world, um, and just so much ground to cover. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to have been able to be exposed to a lot of different um, opportunities in both of those both of those spaces. So uh, my name is Luke McGartland, uh, and this is uh, a little bit of my life and how I think at the intersection of art and technology. Um, so first off, I guess uh, just the, being at the intersection of art and technology, I wanted to uh, do something a little bit different for this presentation than what I've typically done, making PowerPoints or uh, keynote presentations. Uh, and I actually built this as a little interactive website. So you can find a link that my website, lukesmcgartland.com slash gateway dash GIS. Um, and right off the bat, you load this page, there's kind of a fun little interactive map that you can, uh, you can click and drag around. I just wanted to incorporate some of those geospatial uh, visualization elements uh, in here. And so these are all the uh, the outbound flights out of the United States uh, is what's going on in the background there. Um, so uh, kind of going off that theme, a little bit about myself, I wanted to frame this presentation as uh, a little bit of a journey of my life uh, and where I've been, um, where I'm going. Uh, so I grew up uh, in St. Charles, Missouri, um, right across the river. Um, I went to Orchard Farm Elementary School uh, out in very rural St. Charles, and then I went to St. Louis Priory School um, for high school, and uh, absolutely loved high school. Uh, it was a blast, um, and it really started to expose me to, to a lot of the technology that um, I've come to use uh, every single day. So I think that this is like a really awesome time in your lives to get involved. Uh, in art and technology. Uh, and then from Missouri, I made my way westward um, 
kind of ignore Colorado. I did spend a little bit of time there for one summer, but I ended up going to school in Los Angeles, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I made my way to the West Coast, um, spent a little bit of time in Colorado during the summers, uh, and then I have ended up today in San Diego uh, at the kind of northernest part of San Diego County in a little uh, small uh, surf town called Oceanside. Uh, super quiet, not a lot going on here, um, but I work at a company based in Carlsbad uh, right here. Um, and they're a satellite telecommunications company. So San Diego has got a kind of a cool um, technology sector that was that was built around a, a chip company and modem company back in the day, uh, and that's kind of my journey westward of how I how I got out here. But rewinding a bit back to the early days uh, about me, uh, this is me, maybe I don't know, like age eight or something. Uh, so I grew up in St. Charles, St. Louis. Um, this is me working on a little, I think it's a solar powered fan hat to try to keep myself cool uh, during the during a hot sunny day. So I've always been a tinkerer, um, loving to just kind of take things apart, put them back together. Um, one time our, our dishwasher was broken and instead of, I was assigned the chores of uh, doing the dishes by hand, uh, which I really did not want to do. So instead I shut off the power to that circuit breaker that powered the dishwasher, I disassembled the dishwasher and I ended up hot wiring the control panel to, to jumpstart it so that way I could use the dishwasher to do dishes instead of doing them by hand. Uh, so that's a very com common theme in my life that I've always been interested in the technology side, um, but also art as well. Um, this is me probably about your guys' age in high school. It's my friend Danny. Uh, this is me again with a, you'll see a lot of bar bad haircuts uh, and some early photos of me. But, uh, uh, we were working on a, uh, a uh, we took Latin and we built a little cardboard, when I say little, it was like nine feet tall, uh, Trojan horse. Uh, so again, we, we built a little dummy model, figured out how to scale it up and kind of turned this into a whole little art project that ended up staying a little bit more unfinished as cardboard, but um, always interested in kind of building things, uh, and making kind of statements with, with art. So we, we actually built this over a, uh, over I think like the winter holidays and uh, then surprised our, our teachers with when this giant horse showed up in their classroom when they got back. Uh, but uh, going back to that theme about art, um, found some other, other embarrassing photos of myself. Um, I was very inspired by Steve Jobs when I was uh, when I was your guys' age. I feel like Elon Musk is probably the new Steve uh, to you guys, but uh, Apple at the time was releasing iPhones, you know, that had all these new amazing features every single year. And I just, I love the, the thought and um, care that went into the design of these computers. Um, so yeah, this is for my sister's Snapchat. And I was, I was a little too into Steve Jobs, um, but that definitely influenced my thinking around art and technology and that intersection of how do you create great devices, great products um, is what I ended up discovering was kind of the term for uh, these, these things that combined art and technology in a way, thinking about product design uh, as, as something where you could actually make something that was delightful to use, take all these super advanced technology elements um, and mass market it, create it into some sort of consumer application that then people could intuitively go and use. Um, that was really, really appealing to me. And so uh, I think around when I was 12, I started making, I uh, started learning how to program started building apps when I was in middle school and throughout high school uh, for both iOS and Android. Um, but I ended up dropping that uh, for a while and actually switched all the way over to graphic design, got really involved in uh, visual design, um, layout design for newspapers and stuff. Um, but after high school, I, uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And originally I was looking at the University of Southern California for uh, film. Uh, USC, I'm obviously I'm biased because uh, I went there, I think has the best film school in the world. Um, and to me, film was this, this thing where it was the intersection of art and technology and business in the sense that, you know, you had to fund the film, it had to be profitable, you, were, you had this artistic endeavor and there's more and more technology being used in film all the time. Um, however, I did not end up going there for film school uh, because at the time, 
these two guys ended up doing something really revolutionary uh, in, in, in partnership with USC. So you might recognize these faces. It's uh, on the left, uh, Dr. Dre, and on the right, Jimmy Iovine, business partners who started the company Beats by Dre. Um, so Jimmy and Dre uh, were riding high off the success of uh, the sale of Beats to Apple. This is in 20, 2013, 2013, maybe 2012, 2013, um, for I think like $3.2 billion. Um, and they were kind of, you know, trying to figure out what to do, what to do next. Um, and they ended up uh, at Beats, they recognized this problem where with Beats, they were creating this technology product and they were marketing it through art and culture and they wanted, you know, the headphones, the design of the headphones. Um, they had this, this problem though, with finding people to work at the company that understood both the cultural side of music um, and the design as well as the technology to actually make the headphones. They're also working on music streaming service uh, at the time. And so this recruitment problem led them to the idea of founding a school. Uh, and so they partnered with USC to actually create a school uh, specifically designed to teach uh, about art, technology, and the business of innovation is what they call it. So that exactly this, this intersection that you guys are at, um, this is what one of the things that I ended up studying uh, for undergrad. Um, and so Jimmy and Dre uh, sunk a bunch of money into this program. Uh, and I found out about it, you know, right before I, I I uh, started applying to schools and I knew this was something I really, really wanted to do. So I applied and somehow miraculously I, I got in um, and that was a big life shift for me. Again, going from St. Charles, Missouri, and now all of a sudden going out to Los Angeles and studying under the, the tutelage of, of Jimmy and Dre um, was just a, an absolute uh, shift. So at the academy, um, we learned a lot about uh, uh, art. We took classes in the fine arts school. Um, we partnered with the business school and the engineering schools as well, uh, and just took it took a lot of these different classes through all the different schools at USC. And then the academy actually had their own uh, set of courses as well around innovation. Um, and Jimmy and Dre were involved. They brought in guest speakers. You know, talked about some of the things that they were doing at Apple um, with Beats Music. Um, and it was just really awesome to be uh, a part of that experience and get to see how in the real world and their company that they started, this intersection of art and technology was impacting so many people and had turned into this immensely successful business. Um, so really, really cool to, to basically learn the arts of, of both design, worked on a lot of mobile app design, UI design, um, as well as the technology of building those things and then figuring out how to actually take these ideas and these concepts, being able to make them and then figuring out how to sell them as well uh, as part of a business. Um, so that's kind of what the Academy was all about. So that was four years of my life, just 17 through 21. And uh, so I graduated in May of 2018. Uh, and then from there, I've now been uh, in still in Southern California, but in San Diego for the past couple years. So this is a more recent photo of me, still with the longer hair. Uh, I think this is at the uh, Air and Space Museum in San Diego, a little uh, space capsule. Um, but straight out of school, I ended up uh, working at a company that uh, I had interned for, and this is kind of where the Colorado piece comes in, uh, at a company called Viasat Inc. Um, so today I'm a product manager at Viasat. Um, Viasat is one of the leading uh, satellite telecommunications companies in the world. They basically build and operate these uh, high speed, high capacity uh, telecommunications satellites that are used from everything from uh, residential home internet service that you can get anywhere on the continent to um, in-flight Wi-Fi. If you've ever used internet on a plane, chances are Viasat's probably used it. Um, if it was a good experience, it was probably Viasat. If it wasn't a good experience, then it might've been one of our competitors. Uh, as well as uh, we do a lot of stuff with the uh, with the government um, defense uh, applications. Uh, again, being able to connect people anywhere in the world is really really important. Uh, 
And then recently, uh, a newer program called Community Wi-Fi that I was uh, involved with, which included basically connecting people in underserved and rural villages in South America. Uh, and we basically were setting up Wi-Fi hotspots. I'll dive into that. Um, but I think this industry um, has a lot of application, real world applications, I think, of from what Roz has told me about what you guys are learning about um, the science of um, geospatial technology. Geosynchronous satellites um, are special kind of satellite that basically orbit the Earth at the same rate that the Earth rotates. So they're located 22,000 miles away. They're about the size of a school bus. Um, and so basically, BISET has a few of them up right now, um, and we're launching three more over the next few years that'll basically cover the entire planet. Um, but right now, our coverage is basically all North America, some of the transatlantic um, flight paths, as well as a little bit of uh, South America. And then we've partnered with um, a few other satellite providers to operate uh, their satellites uh, in other parts of the world too. I think uh, we have a partnership in Brazil, and so we, uh, we're using the Brazilian satellite to cover parts of Brazil. Um, but I guess what's what's really interesting about this technology is um, it re it really comes down to like you have these satellite dishes. I'm sure you guys have all seen satellite dishes on you know, mounted to the sides of roofs um, or walls or whatever. Um, but when you're you're connecting to the satellite, it is like aiming a laser pointer at this school bus 22,000 miles away in space. And so uh, be, being able to align, figure out the placement of these dish dishes, connecting to the satellite, getting that alignment is critically important to uh, getting that communication link up and running. And the physics of that satellite connection um, depend a lot on that alignment. If you're not totally aligned, um, it really can degrade the connection and it ends up using more uh, internet capacity and then degrade the performance of the entire network. Um, so Biosad has uh, invested a lot in uh, figuring out ways to improve the capacity of their satellites um, and doing things um, that at the time nobody thought was possible to do with satellite communications. And uh, I think you probably hear more about the, the satellite internet uh, race right now uh, in terms of some things that SpaceX are doing. They're doing low earth orbit satellites uh, for internet where they're basically putting up a whole constellation that rapidly orbit the planet and you need basically an entire fleet to cover any part of the earth because they go around so quickly that they, uh, they're they never in the same spot for too long. Uh, whereas our satellites, they're high up enough that basically they can cover a larger area at once. So this is basically a little overview. You have like the fiber backbone that connects you to the, throughout the internet. And then we have a bunch of ground stations placed throughout the country uh, basically, communication goes up, talks to the satellite, and then back down to your little receiver, your reflector um, at your home, and that gets turned into your Wi-Fi. Um, this whole trip takes about 600 milliseconds uh, traveling at the speed of light. So one of the reasons that satellite internet kind of has a bad rep uh, is because of this, this latency, the amount of time that that connection takes, just because it's traveling so far. Um, but there's a lot of ways that uh, this can be kind of uh, avoided by prefetching certain uh, items whenever you're doing an internet connection. We can, we can open up the pipeline a little bit more and prefetch things dynamically, uh, which kind of accounts for for that latency and helps mitigate the effects. Um, but otherwise, like other than latency, it's super fast internet. Um, you can watch, you know, HD, Netflix, stream whatever you want. It's the same sort of uh, service that you'd expect. Um, but going into a little bit more of the um, the geo aspects of this that I think are uh, really relevant, um, again, a real world application of some of the things that you guys might be learning about. Uh, the technology that uh, Vice has really been driving and, and helping pioneer um, are this kind of like beam forming. Um, and so satellites used to be used for um, I mean, we have GPS, um, you also had satellite TV, I think there's like satellite radio um, that I think people used to have before we all started watching Netflix, I guess. Um, but that was traditionally like a lot of what satellite was used for, which is like relaying like kind of single, uh, single way broadcasts. So it's kind of old school satellite on the, on the left, you have basically one beam 
and you're just unicasting to the entire coverage zone, in this case, like the country. And so this is like the idea of like satellite TV is that like there's a broadcaster, they're sending up data, and then it's getting sent back down to everybody. And you don't really have a choice of what you get. Um, and in more modern satellite architecture, you have this idea of beams where you actually can basically target these small little areas um, and basically dynamically change what's getting broadcasted to them, um, both up and down. And so this is one of the things that we use in our satellite technology to basically be able to offer service to a lot of different areas and then also tune the capacity to different areas. Um, so if you think about a map of the United States um, and you look at where people live, uh, you see that most of the population of the country, you know, is, there's, it's concentrated in cities. So what we're able to do with the beams is actually focus basically more or less energy on dense, more densely populated areas to basically get more capacity allocated to those zones than in other zones. So there's a lot of planning that goes into figuring out mapping, you know, who doesn't have connectivity right now, um, where the demand for connectivity is going to be. And then as that demand changes, also updating the satellite configuration to be able to uh, deliver the best quality service to the areas that need it most. So there's a lot of uh, uh, analysis that goes into um, the beam management and figuring out, okay, how, how are we gonna deliver service to these areas? Um, and so an interesting side effect of the way that the coverage is designed uh, with some of the earlier satellites is see so how some of the beams kind of like taper off below Texas. Um, we actually had coverage, oops. Ah, okay, here we go. We actually had coverage in Mexico. So this video, I guess, uh, I guess there's not really a good way to play the video over Zoom, but you can access it it's in the presentation. Um, I'll just kind of maybe speak to it. Um, but this program got started a couple of years ago and it's called Community Wi-Fi. And we had a little bit of coverage in Northern Mexico um, and undervised that to our latest satellite, um, continental Mexico. Um, and we actually started deploying uh, the user terminals, the, the satellite dish that picks up the internet to these villages um, that had basically no internet connectivity at all and then setting up a Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, and so people could basically go to the local store, um, they could buy a pin code, just like on a slip of paper that they would then go connect to the Wi-Fi. It would come up with a little portal, just like you had in Starbucks. They'd enter in the pin code uh, and then they'd be able to use our high-speed internet uh, for like an hour, 30 minutes, or for, they could get like a data pack. So this was pretty transformational um, because previously people had to drive, you know, hours to get to the nearest town um, that had cell coverage. Um, the Mexican government actually has a lot of programs where students do homework uh, and classwork uh, over the internet. And so it's very difficult for, for the unconnected to, to be able to, to do that. And this is kind of opened up some new educational opportunities as well for students to do their homework. Um, of course, everybody uses it for, for streaming video as well, just like us. Um, that's pretty universal uh, stuff that we've seen. Um, but this program has been really, really interesting. Uh, again, tons of planning into figuring out where to go. Um, these towns are totally off the grid. Uh, I've got to go, fortunately, on a visit to a few of them. Uh, flew into Guadalajara uh, and then basically drove hours and hours and hours on unpaved roads um, to these small remote villages that were totally off the map. Sometimes they're not even on the map. They're like, there's one called Cinco Minas, which was, uh, translates to five mines, just because it was like this little mining community. Um, and uh, so one of the things that we do is we develop like in-house this whole kind of targeting algorithm for actually locating uh, these towns um, through a combination of different data sets like satellite imagery and uh, other data that we've, that we've gotten through like censuses and uh, reports. Um, but that basically allows us this kind of site selection algorithm to actually go and locate um, where these villages are, um, maybe how big they are, and what the demand for the internet might be. And that kind of helps us figure out uh, where where we want to go and set these up. Because again, getting out there, it's just incredibly difficult. Um, and like and there are cases where I've heard stories about like 
basically installers going on like camelback, like with the equipment strapped uh, to their camels and like fording these rivers, like just super remote. Um, so being able to kind of have the maps and the technology capabilities to go and, um, and figure out where they are has been really, really helpful um, to, to make this business work. So that's a lot about Biosat, um, a lot about the programs that they do, um, how some of the satellite technology works, um, but combining this art thing and what do I do? Uh, so I'm a product manager there uh, and product management is, is a really interesting role that I wish I had known about much earlier uh, because in this world where you combine art, technology and business, um, you often feel torn between the different disciplines. There's a lot of designers, uh, a lot of engineers, a lot of business people, um, and you know sometimes you have overlap between them. Um, but product management is an interesting role because it kind of sits at the middle of all three. Um, and as a product manager, basically what I do, it's like being it's like being a little CEO of a product, and you kind of figure out what are the needs of the consumers, your customers, um, and basically kind of figure out how do you how do you deliver that experience to meet that need. So you work with designers to, to figure out how to solve the problem. You work with engineers to figure out how feasible the solutions to that problem are um, and how to build it. And then of course, as a business, you, you gotta be accountable to the bottom line. And so you're making sure that you know, you're, you're building something that's gonna be a sustainable business that, that brings in revenue. Um, so as a product manager for community Wi-Fi, uh, I worked on the portal experience for uh, the hotspots. Um, so the actual portal where people would go and connect to the internet, as well as portals where uh, the retailers at the stores would actually go and sell the internet to, to the various people that came through the store. So I worked with a couple teams, uh, engineers and designers um, and the rest of the business stakeholders to figure out the design for those. Um, and that involved doing lots of UX research, going out to these, um, to these villages, learning about the people there. Um, and it's been overall like an incredibly rewarding experience. Um, but product management isn't just limited to technology products um, that you're selling. It can be things that are internal as well. Um, and it's just a really neat role that, again, like a lot of my classmates in the academy, um, we were all kind of getting trained to go and do startups. And we didn't really know about product management at the time. Uh, as, as, as one of these career paths that we could go down um, that really combine all these different things. And I think as the industry um, matures, just the, the entire kind of technology influenced industry, um, product management has become a more and more refined discipline um, with a lot of, of people. It's one of these, one of these roles that, that people are really looking for to, in the future um, because as teams grow smaller, more nimble, more agile, uh, and they need to move between design and technology and business uh, very fluidly. The idea of having somebody kind of sit and look between those different disciplines and figure out, okay, how do we combine these things in a way to make our company successful? Um, that's kind of what a product manager is. Um, so it's been a really cool role. Um, and I definitely would encourage people that are interested in, in things that involve both design and technology uh, to look into it as a uh, potential career path because um, it's definitely something that I wish I had known more about when I was your age. So let's see what I got here. Uh, I guess, yeah, so that's a lot about me, uh, a lot about uh, things that I've worked on, uh, satellites, hotspots, technology, and the kind of the design aspects that go into those. Um, but I wanted to open it up to everybody on the call um, to just for a Q&A, whatever questions you guys have about um, different things that I've worked on or just whatever, um, let me know and uh, just stop sharing. And then I also, uh, I also have a little bit about this presentation too, if you guys are interested in how this is built, because it's all web-based. Um, if you guys are curious about that, I can talk about it. Uh, but yeah, that is it for me, I think in terms of the presentation. So open it up to, to the class. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Who's first? I want to. I wanted to ask something. Okay. All right. Um. Ex excuse me, sir. Uh, um. My name is Malik Andrews, and sir, I just wanted to ask, like, the process for you. Do you feel like it genuinely paid off for all that you went through? Like. 
Yeah, thank you, Malik. Um, I think the process, you know, for me, it was definitely, in some ways it was a very straightforward path. In some ways it hasn't been. Um, I knew, I think when I was your guys' age, that I did, I was, again, being really influenced by, I think, the world at the time, which was very much about like the iPhone and Steve Jobs. I knew that I wanted to build products. Um, but as I got a little bit older, um, one of the things that I was looking for in my career after I graduated, I had a couple of different opportunities that popped up and I had started to also get involved in, um, I didn't really know much about the public sector, I guess is an easy way to put it. Um, and I was very much focused on like private sector entrepreneurship. Um, and I think after the 2016 election that really like a lot of technology people didn't think about politics or just the, the rest of the kind of world and how that worked. Um, and so one of the things that I also got interested in in college was the idea of social enterprise and the idea that a business doesn't only have to have uh, uh, revenue as its, as its bottom line. You could have a double bottom line of some sort of social impact as well as making money. So you look at companies like Tom's and the one for one shoe model. Um, and so this was something that I really wanted to kind of take with me. I think this is like the evolution of the, of this journey and what, whether it was worth it um, that, Again, there was there were a lot of ups and downs. I did some startups and that didn't work out. Um, but the idea of of kind of making it to this place to think about that you could build products, build a business that one you could create delightful experiences, help people, uh, make money, um, but then also have this this social impact. I think is really important. I think that's only going to become more important as the world realizes. Um, the way that we've set up kind of our operating models in, uh, in the business world aren't, aren't the most sustainable, especially as, as we see the way our planet is changing, um, the climate. We're going to have to pivot a little bit away from solely just making money um, as part of the business objectives and having this kind of social enterprise bottom line. So just going back to like, was this journey all worth it? Uh, yes, I do think so. I think there were, there were so many things that I didn't, anticipate or understand uh, early on, but that kind of came back later, um, just over time um, that, you know, one of, I guess I'll tie this back a little bit to one of my, my, one of my favorite things from Steve Jobs is like, you can't connect the dots looking forwards. You can only connect them looking backwards. So a lot of the different things that I worked on only looking backwards, uh, I've realized that, you know, have given me the, the skill sets and the opportunities to go pursue new things just by, picking up something from the art world here, the tech world here. Now I can bring them together to do something new that nobody else has done before. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. That's your question. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, sir. I did. Yeah. Luca got a question for you. Uh, so I'll just tell you more yeah. about what I, what it is I do. So I uh, work for the city of St. Louis's economic development arm. And one of our goals is to, along with creating workforce pipelines, uh, bring talent, talented individuals to the St. Louis region or retain them and prevent them from leaving to Southern California like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with that yep. being said, um, you know, what are some things that you think St. Louis is missing, especially having lived experience here that would, that would help a retaining folks in this region to create those yeah. innovative products and be a part of that growing tech sector? That's a good question. Um, it is it is interesting having been fortunate enough to travel to a lot of places. I spent some time and got the opportunity to go up to, to Northern California, go to Silicon Valley, to Sand Hill Road, seeing like meeting the invest like the, like the heart of Silicon Valley, and you you kind of go you go there, and it has this it it does it is a little bit this this kind of mecca of this energy of people wanting to do startups, which I think are a good vehicle, not the only vehicle for, uh, for combining a lot of art and, and design uh, and technology in ways that people previously hadn't had the opportunities at, at traditional companies. Um, and so you go there and you feel this energy and it's a little bit overblown now, overhyped and obviously rent there is way too expensive. But it, it's interesting with the pandemic now that it has forced the technology sector, especially to adapt in a way where you know, people are remote and people are leaving New York, they're leaving California and they're, they're 
going back to their hometowns because they realize, hey, they can work there, um, kind of do the same thing. And, you, and workflows are being built now asynchronously such that you don't have to be in the office day to day with people now. Do I miss that? Yes, I prefer actually being in the office. But it, it has made me realize a little bit uh, more about starting an organization or a company and how you can do that um, in a remote way. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot of people that left the Midwest to, and went coastal come back over the next few years, one, because of COVID, um, but two, just because I think the companies are now allowing a lot more flexibility as well. But in terms of particularly what St. Louis has to offer, um, it's interesting, again, because uh, a lot of places claim to be like the next Silicon Valley. They, they want to be the like L.A. tries to be the Silicon Beach. I, I know St. Louis has, has, a, has a small thriving tech sector as well. Um, and it, it is interesting. I think I think there is um, something to be gained from a um, almost like a pilgrimage out to to to. Silicon Valley and kind of seeing and experiencing what that was like and then bringing that back, I think is the most important thing. So I think one of the things that I, when I've come back to St. Louis and I've engaged in some of the different technology events and stuff and kind of seen, just like people are really, really excited. Um, but I guess the, I think there's just so much more potential that a lot of people don't even realize that once they, if they, if they go and they see, you know, what um, has been done, um, and Silicon Valley and just the, like the scope is enormous. And so that's one of the things that I guess I'm excited that there will be more people coming back into the Midwest um, and bringing that scope with them. And I think getting the key to getting them to stay, um, on, honestly, the, I, I think we're just gonna see a lot of um, companies get started. I think during during the course of this pandemic that and as people come back, I think the idea that these new companies that, you know, they start here, um, that's kind of going to be their home base and right. they can they can attract people back to them. So I think that's the most important thing is just starting in new places in not California is is probably the one the one thing that I would like to that I would like to do for the next company that I start. I don't, I don't want to have it be be based in California. Um, so that's uh, that's probably my long winded answer. So it sounds like, in summary, that we just need more support for our small business sector, startup sector in here in St. Louis. Ab absolutely, yeah. It may, it may I, be yeah. partnering them with a with a larger uh, mentor, uh, you know, company uh, based out of California or anywhere internationally. But the point is having that mentorship yeah, I, set I, up. I think there's a lot that that the larger technology companies should do. Um, to they as they again the changing workforce. You see companies uh, like Figma are moving to like kind of a, a hub model where they're going to open up like little hubs offices that people come in some days a week work remotely the rest of the time. I think if, if, you know, Microsoft, Apple, Google can open up more of those hubs throughout the country and give people the opportunity to work at these companies remotely, um, but still going to go into the office environment and invest in the communities where they, where they place them. I think that would go a long way because there's no need to build these like multi-billion dollar office buildings and, you know, wherever. And then now nobody's done that. Like, Share the share the space and and invest into the into the local communities because there's so much raw talent that's just waiting to be tapped into. I agree. You have a, several several of those young people on this call right now who have that amazing raw talent exactly. that just needs the uh, the mentorship and someone to, to extract that and challenge them in a way that you know they can see the practical benefits of, of that work. Yeah. Hello, Luke. This is Mr. Ferguson. Got um. In this field, um, what particular certifications that a kid would, you know, would, would be beneficial to pursue? I know you were, you at the uh, uh, in, in a yeah. position where you're managing everybody, but let's say, for instance, with all the opportunities that's out there, with you guys are doing a lot of satellite in terms of security and those type of management things? What kind of certification that you see that's out I think there? for me, um, I was, <laughs> I think I, I was uh, very lucky. I think when I was, when I was, uh, when I was in high school that I, that I, I typically tended to be, I was, a, I was a, I was a pretty good student. I was pretty nerdy. Um, and so for me, school was 
was this this way that I kind of like I feel like a lot of the times that school exposed me to things but then where I where I really like I think learned a lot was like doubling down on the things that really excited me and just and and researching and learning on my own as well and in in partnership you have to I think invest your time and your own energy in addition to the activity like the school like you have amazing teachers and professors that teach you but the I think the most important step in in your journey is is also investing your own energy and time back into that that same curriculum and teaching yourself um, and that for me uh, was a really important part of my journey I started developing apps when I was 12 uh, and that kind of came from uh, I was I was very interested in this idea that uh, that I think Lego had these like programmable Lego bricks like Lego Mindstorms and you could build little robots and uh, I went to this this camp and I saw that and I was like well if I can program this Lego robot I think they actually at the science center they had they have a cool little thing where you can do that and that's how I got exposed to it at a really young age um, and I just thought you know the iPhone was was I think the 3GS had just come out the four was on its way. I, I thought if I can program this Lego thing, why can't I program a, uh, an iPhone? So I saved all of my money for two years cutting uh, grass in the, the neighborhoods in St. Charles, bought a computer and then went to my local library and I checked out every single book on program, programming apps that I could find. Um, I didn't have, um, kind of any other resources, which I think you guys are really lucky um, to have uh, now with like just the way that like the app and the, the web development industry have developed so much. You can find all the resources you'd ever need online and you don't even need high power computers anymore. You can actually get um, basically free computing power from the cloud to go and run projects if you need to um, because Amazon wants you to go use their cloud provider in the future. So they give away so much, uh, so much commuting, uh, computing power if you need it. So this kind of idea, like, I really sunk a lot of time into these side projects that I was really passionate about, and those, like, helped evolve um, my skills, um, and I think that, for me, was good for my learning style, and I know that's not the same for everybody else, but I guess going back to your question around, like, certifications, like, what do you need? Uh, I think, in summary, learning to code is this, like, fundamental skill that, as the world becomes more and more um, transformed by AI and technology, like just basic programming skills are so important. You don't need, I think for that, a certification. I didn't go to engineering school. Um, I did take some engineering classes, but I think the most of what I learned about programming was just picking stuff up from like online from books. Um, so I think that is, is one quote unquote, I guess like certification that I'd really recommend uh, everybody to pursue. Uh, even if you don't use it, it's just amazing to have that kind of conceptual understanding um, and being able to tap into that and communicate with other engineers in the future um, if that's if that's people that you work with. Um, so that's my kind of long-winded answer on on certifications. And you know, I'm glad that uh, Mr. Ferguson uh, brought that up. Okay, and what what was that certification that you recommended? There is what, no what, I, I didn't recommend anything in particular. It was. It, it, it was really, it was really just the, the idea that if you, if you learn to code, I think a lot of people, including my, like if I went out to go hire an engineer right now, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be looking for any particular certification. I would be looking for examples of side projects and things that, that they've, that they've done uh, as right. examples, because they're, because of the way that that particular industry has developed, you, you, all the resources are all online available for free. Um, yeah. And so what I, what I'd be looking for in hiring is, is just the, the side projects and the passion. And I think okay. I want to interject, Mr. Ferguson, and look if you don't mind, because what I'm also seeing is that it's not as much emphasis on certification, like you said, Luke, it's about what can you show me you can do, okay? Yeah. So I think if that helps, Mr. Ferguson, I'm glad to hear that Luke is saying the same thing that I'm hearing. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, that being said, I will say uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, has kind of built yeah. I don't like how they do this. Um, Salesforce does the same thing. They kind of like build these like certifications for their platforms and it's kind of a way to like kind of keep their talent reined in um, as opposed to being open. But in terms of like if someone is looking for an interesting set of skills, I think is going to be really, really important in the future. Really, really uh, applicable. Getting certified in Amazon Web Services is 
an amazing skill. So if you're interested, not in programming, but understanding the infrastructure of how all of our technology platforms work, um, how did like all the servers and stuff get managed behind the scenes and the cloud, mm -hmm. uh, pursuing an, an AWS certification is like, there are not enough people that know how to do that stuff. Um, and that's a, that's an incredible skill. Cause then you can basically any, every programmer. So even if you learn how to code, if you can't deploy your code to the, to the cloud, uh, you're kind of lost. So like having that, uh, uh, that career path around cloud infrastructure and being able to help the different engineers or artists, uh, distribute their, their creations to the world, which is all done through the cloud. Now that's huge. So I will, I will, uh, I will give that a two thumbs up. Okay. Okay. Hey, Luke, I have a question for you. Tell us about some of the things yeah. you're reading, you know, some of the websites, yeah. you're reading, some of the, the, the videos you're watching. Let us That's know some of the things that keep you abreast as to what's going on. So uh, I'm on Goodreads uh, for one. So you can follow me on Goodreads uh, on my website. I think I have like links to all my, my different social profiles. So please follow me on Twitter or whatever, um, I, I like to recommend things. So the book I'm reading, I'm reading a couple of books right now. Uh, one, this is a reread, it's called Creativity Inc. And this is actually the perfect book, I think for this group. So I cannot recommend it enough. And I like this book a lot because it is, and on, on a reread, it's interesting because it's actually a leadership book um, and it's, but the first time I read it, it, it definitely came across as a, as, as um, it's about Pixar. Um, and so how they developed this company that basically stood at that intersection of art and technology. Um, and it's written by Ed Catmull, who was the president, I think he's still the president of Pixar. He's one of the founders. So Pixar got started by, uh, it was actually started at Lucasfilm, it was a division, and basically they were doing computer graphics before anybody else. Um, and Lucas, uh, George Lucas, uh, I think he got divorced, lost a bunch of his money. Um, he had to sell a part of the company and he ended up making the Star, Star Wars prequel trilogy. Um, so he sold off Pixar um, and Steve Jobs actually ended up buying it. Right. And so Steve Jobs sunk a bunch of money into it. And basically their passion at Pixar, they were, they were figuring out how to make all this, like basically Ed Catmull, he was the, he was the engineering brains and then John Lasseter was the storytelling guru uh, and then Steve put in all the money and then just kind of stayed out of the way. Um, but what they ended up being passionate about was creating animated movies. And so they eventually produced Toy Story, which is the first animated feature film of all time. Um, and so, but that journey of getting there was like just totally crazy. Basically they were in research uh, institutions, you know, Disney didn't want to work with them at first. Uh, and they they didn't know how to make an animated film. Nobody had ever done it before, so they're writing the playbook on that. Um, and so this this book was just interesting because Ed Catmull being just like a really smart dude um, in the sense that he invented just so many of the, like the animation concepts that are in every single computer today um, was also figuring out how to create a culture of creativity that would outlast him. Um, and I think you, I think we've seen that in a lot of the films that Pixar's released, they just keep churning out hit after hit after hit. And it's interesting to look at the culture and how they built that. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I'd, I'd recommend this book. Um, Luke, other books I, that I'm reading. Uh, yep. I just yeah. wanted to give We're you a time. big, I just wanted to give you a big thanks. Within about two minutes, I have to teach my next virtual class. So I'm going to sign off, but I wanted to tell you, thanks so much for everything you're sharing with us. It's been really awesome. I appreciate it. It's been, it's been great. Thank you. We'll do. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Luke, can you show the book again? Because I had a couple more people who were late joining us. Okay. Yeah. Creativity Inc. Um, this is a good one. Um, what else have I been reading? Um, let me open up my Goodreads. Um, I'm reading Educated right now um which is an interesting book on like this woman who was raised in a fundamentalist fundamentalist family in idaho like on a mountainside didn't have a birth certificate until she was like 12 years old um and just about her journey about like she ended up going to like i think uh, oxford or cambridge or something um i'm not that far into it but that's been really interesting um i try to read 
a, a really wide variety of things. Um, I'll share my screen. What about online tools? Any YouTube series you're listening to? Any lecture speaker series? Yeah, I yeah. Um, oh, this is a cool book. Uh, Recursion. If you're a fan, I'm a big uh, Christopher Nolan fan. For as far as films go, I saw Tenet, um, which was amazing. Uh, Recursion is an interesting sci-fi fiction uh, novel um, that uh, deals with memory and time travel. Uh, super cool. Dune is another really good book, sci-fi classic. So I do read a lot of sci-fi, I think. Uh, and then I try to mix that up with also uh, um, with also some nonfiction here and there. Um, in terms of videos I watch uh, on YouTube, um, I tend uh, to, as far as YouTube goes, I don't do, I, I, I like to read articles. It's when I'm like trying to learn something more than I do like watching videos. Um, my favorite YouTube channel though is probably uh, Pitch Meetings on Screen Rant, which is just a funny thing about a guy like talking to himself about pitching movies and going over all the, the plot details I ever missed. So that's just a funny thing. But I, I don't know if there's any channels that I really like. Uh, I do subscribe to, I think I get a lot of my, my updates actually though through Twitter is where I learn a lot of things. Um, what's interesting in the, there's definitely like a design bubble on Twitter and a technology bubble and like a startup bubble that sometimes you can get a little sucked into, but it's cool to see a lot of the, the people that are on the bleeding edge of um, design trends start posting, like posting their work and you kind of see where, where things are going in user interface design, uh, like different researchers. Um, I saw this really amazing um, concept posted one time on Twitter uh, that was about you know, we kind of had our user interfaces and our phones used to be skeuomorphic. They looked like the real world uh, objects uh, that we use every day. Like the notes app looked like a notepad um, and then everything got super flattened. And now there's kind of a swing, swing back towards skeuomorphism and adding more texture. And somebody did this really cool demo about like actually mapping light from the real world through the camera and then projecting that onto the UI elements in the phone. And so like all the shadows would like correspond with the real lighting in the room. So I don't know, I, I think I get a lot of updates through Twitter on those sorts of things and I just read through them. Well, they're great. that's great. That, that helps us keep keep abreast as to what's some of, some of the growing trends uh, in your industry and abroad, you know? Yeah, Twitter is, de Twitter is definitely how I keep up with that. Okay, thanks for that. Okay. Hey, uh, Luke, this is Mr. Ferguson again. Yeah, yeah this is Mr. Ferguson again. Uh, we, uh, myself, is same as Tom. We we have classes at twelve, so I'm a little late myself, and as All well right. as the kids. So, I I just want to say that I enjoyed your presentation. I enjoyed the uh, the whole session with you because one, I want to thank you because it allows our kids to see that you know the drive that you have, what it takes. And to, to, to kind of go after the things that you wanted to go after. And not only that, your skill and your imagination can lead you anywhere if you just let it go and just go for it. So I really appreciate it because this session is, I really enjoyed it. I really did. Your journey thank was, you, thank was, you. was definitely, definitely great. And to come from the same area and just the curiosity about different things and how you got how it led you to other things. That's, those are things that were just amazing and great for the kids to do. So I want to thank I appreciate you. that. Thank you. All right. Okay. Wow. Um, Luke, uh, you and I had talked about uh, how we can get some of our young people from Gateway GIS cohort, uh, especially, you know, from Clyde, since we have the support of Mr. Bass and Mr. Ferguson how we can get them involved in uh, a beta testing or focus group for your project? Uh, well, Roz, uh, I am working on, on some new projects that um, I actually, I don't think I can talk too much about it yet, but um, I think in the future, I really want to, to work with this group as I continue to uh, work on new products and definitely want to keep, keep this group in mind for for beta testing and trying things out. So 
for if you do have people that are interested in the uh, in in the film world and making the films, definitely uh, connect me with them, and uh, and I, you know I will keep them in the loop with uh, my upcoming projects there. Okay, great, great, Mr. Ferguson, did you hear that? Or did he probably? It seems like he's no. Probably, I think he I, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. No, no, I'm still here. I'm just monitoring my other got the computer, two computers going. Uh, yes, I did hear that, and. I know we have several kids that are definitely interested in, and, and um, we, we we definitely can make that connection with some of those kids. And awesome. those kids for the beta, I've been talking to the kids about the testing. So I'm looking forward to that. So yeah, okay. we're good. Good, good, thank cool. you. Okay. Alvir, I'm so glad you joined us. I know you had some other things to do, but I'm glad you joined us. I sent you the link, Alvia, because I saw you when, when you joined, you know, I said, okay, you missed part of his presentation, but I did send you the link. So, I mean, Alvia, I've worked with Alvia Luke, for oh, the last few years, getting Gateway GIS off the ground. But Alvia, what do you think about what you've heard so far? I heard very little. I saw some books and I will talk to you more. I work in a Zoom live with faculty around the world, actually, through Webster right now. So I have Zoom here. I was just talking to faculty in Vienna. So when 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 you look, we're presenting that thing about creativity. But definitely, I mean, that's good stuff. Uh, I'll talk to Dr. Ross about the whole project again more. But I'm here to support okay. the whole project. Great. Thanks, Alvira, for joining us. Yeah, great to be Yeah. I'm in Faculty Development Center with Webster University for the past 12 years. I'm from Bosnia originally, but I like your story. Look what you told me, how you put so much effort and uh, how you start from zero and build up everything. And it's kind of what uh, I did with my whole life coming to the U.S., what Dr. Rose is familiar with. So I fully understand where you're coming from when you say all of these things that that's very important to have that drive, but how to build that drive in others. That's something what I'm trying even to do with Bosnian refugees, uh, as Dr. Rose knows, and that's important for all children in St. Louis area yeah. and broader and that to create that motivation and keep them going. That's all I can say speak from what I do with refugees. Um, <laughs> Richard Alvear is phenomenal. I mean, because you still deal with people from all over the world because Webster University, you know, has, you know, campuses literally all over the world. And that's what he does. But at the same time, he speaks several languages and he's helped me with some other projects. Amazing. He's dealing with different communities that are some of the, you know, some of the communities that you even address, Luke, you know, some of your work. So I, I'm so glad that you joined us, Alvear, from the L3. We have a touch base so you can give me some update. I know you're recording this session, so I hope I can uh, watch the recording and learn more. I apologize to you for joining late because I'm still in the other meeting, but it's quiet right now. So, <laughs> okay. Apologize. I've, I've been there double dipping on the, on the meetings. It happens to me at work. Tell you because it's very important what you were saying, but I just heard a little bit. And, but um, I appreciate everybody what they are trying to do. Uh, we still have any, do we still have any students on? Do they have any more questions? I'm surprised I didn't hear from Kenyatta. I'm picking on you, Kenyatta. Okay, I was trying to think of the correct way to ask my question. So Go for it. With, with us staying, because I don't see us letting up on, you know, being closed down. Do you think that with your whole, what is it? Okay, words are evading. You shouldn't put me on the spot, Dr. Oz. But with the satellites, do you think that there will be more in demand? And instead of just having one covering the entire like United States, we can have multiple the multiple of them at different yeah. angles. And we could possibly mm -hmm. what I was thinking is like send some Wi-Fi and stuff like that to like, you know, less developed countries and get their education up so they can in turn yep. learn like learn from it, work from it and better it. Absolutely. Everything you're saying that it's, it's going to happen. Um, so there's a couple of different approaches. So the, the kind of satellite technology that Biostat works on, they're geosynchronous. So those are the ones that they're really, really high altitude. They orbit the planet at the same rate of rotation. So they appear stationary relative to the planet. And so they can cover because they're so far away. You think of it like a flashlight. So 
you know, if you're close to a wall, you point a flashlight at it, it's a really small beam, but then you get further away and it, it, it grows. Um, and so that's the kind of technology that our satellites are, even though we can divide it in little small beams or whatever. Um, you're still using just basically like one huge flashlight to cover a large area. So Viasat is launching a constellation of three satellites. Each one of them will cover a third of the planet. So sometime in the middle of this decade, I don't know. They keep, I don't know what the launch dates are. Um, I just know they're, they're working on, they're building them. They're expensive. Uh, they're going to put up these three satellites and then we will have complete coverage of the entire planet on like a one unified satellite platform uh, that will offer, um, I forget how fast they are. I think they're like a terabit speed. So uh, speed's kind of, it's kind of meaningless. And don't worry about speed. Um, it's just, they they offer, it's like a, it's, it's more like a, it's like a pipe in the sense that you have a much larger pipe so you can send more data through all at once. Um, that being said, simultaneously, you've probably seen a lot of uh, stuff about SpaceX in the news, potentially. Um, they're pursuing a totally different strategy where they're doing uh, low Earth orbit, LEO satellites um, that are much, much closer to the Earth so they don't have the high latency. But again, like the flashlight analogy, because they're so close to the planet, their beam is much, much smaller. So you need more of them to cover the entire planet. And because they're closer to the planet, the orbital mechanic means that they are basically, they're constantly moving, they're rotating the planet, um, which means that your terminal that you're using to actually get the signal on your side means that you actually have to track them. So this is something we do on the planes because the plane, like when you're using the internet on the plane, like the plane's moving really, really fast and you actually have to track the satellite. But even for just like being on the ground, you're still gonna have to track their satellites. Uh, as they move through the sky. And then once one gets out of range, it has to like switch back over to another one. Um, so that's a different strategy that they're using. But SpaceX is really interesting because uh, launching things into orbit used to be much, much more expensive. And so the, the financial model for doing satellite internet only made sense to do a geosynchronous satellite. So like we only have to put up three satellites and get the whole planet covered where SpaceX has to put up like 10,000, but they can launch 60 at a time and they basically get a really big discount because they're, they're, they own the whole vertical pipeline of actually launching the satellites, making them and operating them. So there's gonna be a lot of competition in that space, um, but also a lot of innovation that's gonna be happening because there's gonna be this whole new space economy that will exist because of the technology that SpaceX is, is developing around putting things into orbit much, much more cheaply. Um, so I definitely think that's something in your guys' lifetimes, like that's gonna that will be a new industry that does not exist today. Is is a is a space economy industry. Um, but and then regards to your kind of second part to the question about connecting the unconnected, uh, from our estimates, uh, and I think like from other companies, I think like Facebook, there's probably about a billion people, maybe like half a billion to a billion, uh, still a lot of people either way that will only be able to be connected to the internet via satellite because the economics of running terrestrial internet, like such as fiber or cable, you actually have to like lay down these wires and in, into the ground. Uh, it's just too expensive to get to some of these really remote areas. Whereas like our terminal, you just, you got to haul it out there. You got to give it power, but you just put it in the ground, point it at the sky, and then you have instant internet. So that's a lot cheaper if you're trying to get out to this like jungle village um, than laying fiber optic cable for hundreds of miles. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely going to be a subset of the population that will probably exclusively be connected through the internet, through satellite internet. Hope, hope that answers your, your questions. So can you, it, it, and thank you for your time, but I kind of do have to go to class now. Okay. <laughs> I think that's, that's probably good. true for most of the students that, you know, are in between classes with this online, you know, um, I guess you say scheduling for yeah. that. Uh, so before we wrap up, is there anything else from anyone else um, right now? Caleb, you know, G Dansler, any of you all, anything else before we wrap up? Okay, if not, then Luke, what are your... Um, Closing words, you know, for, you know, for those who were able to come in and out doing, you know, throughout your presentation. Oh, 
A lot of pressure. Um, closing words. You know, I think in 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 some ways, I I, I really empathize. You know, the, the, this journey. I think that's kind of something that we talked about in this conversation of learning these skills of art and technology, combine them in new ways that people haven't done before. And you guys are trying to build a whole curriculum and teach these skills. You know, this, the schools don't exist for it, and that's why I really. Uh, really love what you're what you're doing because again that that was part of my experience was taking a chance on on a program that had just come into existence to teach skills that didn't exist um i guess the the biggest thing that, that i would hope that as you guys watch the recording this presentation take away is that there are people that, that have done this this journey and they're very happy to to help um because it is really hard as much as i said you know talking about like you know, learning, I'm, a, I'm kind of a self learner, but there are so many times where I wished that I did have a mentor to reach out to or somebody just ask for help. Um, and when I was learning different things about whether it was a piece of software or, or a tool or whatever. Um, so I would just encourage everybody that's on this call, you can get my contact information from Roz, reach out to me if you have a question about building apps or websites or uh, server code, or if you want to learn how to you know, do motion graphics, uh, video editing, uh, whatever, um, color grading, uh, you know, just definitely reach out to me and I'd be happy to point you in the right direction. Um, because there's so many times where that saved me a lot of time when somebody else has kind of been through that before has pointed me in the right direction. So, uh, I would definitely encourage you guys all, if you are interested in this intersection of art and technology, but don't know where to, where to go next. Um, just, uh, reach out really, would really love to hear from you. And look, I think if you don't mind me saying this, this is helping as Gateway GIS continues to evolve. And it is to find that gap where, you know, we can provide the most, you know, for those who are interested in, you know, how we look at STEAM education and how GIS is a part of it, but it's not the overall part of it. It's about STEAM. And like you were just saying, I think there is this gap, you know, where there's this intersection with art and technology. Yeah. So I think uh, looking at what you're saying, what we're really most in need of is mentoring. What we also in need of is, is the internships, okay? But at the same time, focusing on helping us to see that intersection you know, and really develop those necessary skill sets. And like you said, you know, there's not a whole lot of certifications that's needed for that, but the one that you did mention, of course, uh, which is the one uh, that deals with Amazon, right? Uh, oh, I do, yeah, I do recommend that uh, if you wanna be, a, a good skill set that I think is not gonna go out of out of uh, demand anytime soon is cloud cloud infrastructure. Uh, so, always recommend that. But I, I, yeah. There's so many interesting things too, and I feel like maybe by the time that somebody looks back at some of the things that I'm saying, I'm probably already outdated from the sense that like there's so many no code technologies where you don't have to know how to code. And it's like really point and click and kind of configuration to like build really powerful services are all coming into play. And like, I do think that some of the next wave of startups and companies will be built on these no code technologies that as much as I'm saying, hey, learn to code to be able to do things that Computers are, are good for things that, that humans aren't in a lot of ways, which is why I think it's such a critical skill. And I think even in this talk is I've talked a lot about engineering and a lot of my day is spent around engineering. I don't want that to diminish the, the impact of art and design on my, on, on my field as well. Uh, it's, it's a really, really critical part. And I see engineering as one of simply the tools to, by which I express myself. I, I like to think of, uh, I paint, um, painting with pixels, um, in some, in some ways, painting with code, uh, is how sometimes I think about some of the work that I do. Um, and so I really just think like the, the more ways you have to like express yourself, um, and the, the kind of tools that you have, um, to be artistic with what you do. Um, that's one of the ways I think you find that, that intersection. Um, and I do think that, that the engineering, the computer uh, space is, does allow for a lot of flexibility, which is why I uh, can't recommend it enough. Okay. Okay. Well, everyone, thank you all very much. And Luke, thank you so much. I mean, words can I express? Thank you, Roz, for, for having me.
Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderfonderfully blessed day, okay? And bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.